Swami Vivekananda is not a song parivar icon. Liberal progressives allowed it his appropriation. Yogendra Yadav. Is Swami Vivekananda an ally of the politics that seeks to reclaim our republic today? Or is he an ideologue of Hindu supremacy? A forefather of the RSS and the politics of what is presented as Hindu toward these days? A recent book has reopened this debate. Govinda Krishan's his book, Vivekananda, the philosopher of freedom, makes a bold claim on its cover page. How the Sang Parivar's greatest icon is its arc nemesis. The 485-page long book substantiates the thesis that Vivekananda's thought stands in direct opposition to all the fundamental tenets of Hindutva. To its parochial concept of Hinduism, its insular nationalism and cultural conservatism, its authoritarian collectivism and anti-intellectualism. This thesis is not some academic quibble that might interest just the historians of ideas. The interpretative context over Vivekananda is a political dispute about India's present and future. Hence, my interest in this matter. Though I am not a Vivekananda scholar, Govinda Krishan manages to sustain this argument by delving deep not just into Vivekananda's religious and social philosophy, but also by placing them in the context of ideas prevalent in pre-nationalist India and the Victorian age of the West. This timely book rescues the legacy of Swami Vivekananda for the most pressing political task, reclaiming the Indian Republic in the face of the most insidious onslaught that it faces today. Vacuum of cultural nourishment. Sadly, secular politics has wilted in the face of this challenge. Instead of discovering new ideas, tapping new streams and making new friends, the liberal progressive camp has shrunk the catchment area of its cultural nourishment. Contrast this with the RSS BJP. They have expanded their reach to recruit within their fold historical figures who they have little reason to claim as their own. Sardar Patel, Subhash Chandra Bose, Jay Prakash Narayan, Ram Manohar Loya, and even Bhagat Singh. Capturing the ideological legacy of Vivekananda was much easier for the Sang Parivar. Average modern educated Indians knew little about Vivekananda, except that he was the great orator who mesmerized the world at a convention held in Chicago. They relate to Swami Vivekananda largely through the inspiring image of a saffron-clad Hindu sannyasi that evokes intense but vague pride in being Indian and Hindu. That is all the RSS would like them to know. They would be shocked to discover that while Swamiji practiced the monk's bow of brahmacharya and non-acquisition of wealth, he was a regular and open smoker, a non-vegetarian who cooked and relished modern dishes and had nothing but contempt for the physical activity of yoga. The Sang Parivar's hero had no patience for the drive to build new temples and nothing but scorn for the campaigns of Goraksha that turned a blind eye to poverty and starvation among human beings. They would be shocked to discover that while Swamiji practiced the monk's bow of brahmacharya and non-acquisition of wealth, he was a regular and open smoker, a non-vegetarian who cooked and relished mutton dishes and had nothing but contempt for the physical activity of yoga. The Sang Parivar's hero had no patience for the drive to build new temples and nothing but scorn for the campaigns of Goraksha that turned a blind eye to poverty and starvation among human beings. Clearly, such a Swami hardly fits the bill as an icon for the Sang Parivar. Their misappropriation was made by the attitude of the liberal progressive camp that ranged from benign indifference to active suspicion of Swami Vivekananda. More often than not, it was silence or polite praise. But at times, the Sang Parivar's desire to own Vivekananda was masked by the secular camp's attempts to disown him. Beginning with Prabhat Dikshit 1975 article, which held him responsible for providing an ideological rational to the politics of Hindu communal movements, and culminating into Jyotirmoy Sarma's 2013 book, A Restatement of Religion, Swami Vivekananda and the Making of Hindu Nationalism, there have been many attempts to portray Vivekananda as a Hindu supremacist and social conservative. These interpretations have challenged earlier too, notably by Tapan Rai Choudhury in 1998, G. Bakerly in 2003, and Swami Medhananda, alias Ayan Maharaj in 2020. 
Govinda Krishan's book helps us to put such misreadings to rest. Hindu, not supremacist. Swami Vivekananda was a believing and practicing Hindu, a proud Hindu who thought Hinduism had something special to contribute to humanity. He stood up against the prevailing tendency in his time among colonials as well as educated Indians to ridicule Hinduism. But that does not make him a Hindu supremacist. Barring one instance involving an intemperate reaction to Christian missionaries, he never said anything negative about any other religion. In fact, he used to carry the book, The Imitation of Christ with him and his relation with Jesus Christ can only be described as devotion. As for Islam, Swami Vivekananda insisted that the decline of Indian society was due to its inequality and insularity, not to be blamed on Muslim invaders. He praised Islam for its practice of equality and brotherhood, for being the only religion to realize Advaitism in practice. What about Vivekananda's belief that Vedanta philosophy was superior to all other religions? Indeed, Vivekananda did place all religions in a hierarchy beginning with Dvaita, dualism, going up to Bishista Dvaita, qualified dualism, and culminating in Advaita, non-dualism which he considered to be the essence of Hinduism. Scholars like Meghananda argued that this was a passing phase in Vivekananda's intellectual evolution and that his mature view was that all religions had different paths, one of the four yokes to realize the truth. Even if we discontent this interpretation, it would be an odd thing to accuse a believing Hindu or Muslim or Christian of believing that his religion is true in a way that is special. For a Hindu to say so in the face of colonial cultural onslaught was an act of self-affirmation. And above all, this superiority of Hindu philosophy was basically its ability to recognize the truth of all other religions. It would be weird to see this as religious supremacism. So, like Mahatma Gandhi's adherence to Hinduism or Maulana Ajat devotion to Islam. Vivekananda's propagation of Hinduism is perfectly compatible with the secular doctrine of non-domination of any religion over other and the principled distance of the state from organized religions. Swami Vivekananda's theory of universal religion provides the perfect philosophic basis for not just toleration of different religions, but the need for and celebration of religious diversity a critic of caste inequalities. A similar misreading, if not deliberate distortion, presents Vivekananda as a defender of the caste system and Brahmin supremacy. Govinda Krishan devotes a long chapter to presenting and refuting such insinuations. A plain reading of Vivekananda's remarks on caste shows that he makes a clear distinction between caste in a generic sense as a species and caste as a system of social hierarchy. He defends the former as a universal expression of species diversity and rejects the latter as an irrational and unjust social arrangement that is and should be on its way out. As he put it, modern caste distinction is a barrier to India's progress. It narrows, restricts, separates. It will crumble before the advance of ideas. Similarly, he uses Brahmin in two different senses both familiar in the Indian intellectual traditions as an abstract reference to anyone who displays specified virtues and as a special group defined by an accident of birth. He upholds the former and denounces the latter for their failure to live up to the virtues expected of them. He went to the extent of saying that Brahmin caste is erecting with its one hand its one sefulka. And that is what ought to be. It is good and appropriate that every caste of high birth and privileged nobility should make it its principal duty to raise its one funeral pyre with its own hands. Vivekananda was no sociologist and his views on this subject suffer from ambiguity, evasion and inconsistency. But it would be mischievous to fault his intent. Vivekananda was among the early Indians, if not the very first, to talk about socialism. He was in touch with British socialist poet Edward Carpenter in London and the anarchist thinker Peter Kropotkin in Paris. 
Anyone who reads Vivekananda cannot miss a strong egalitarian streak running through his writings. He was among the earliest uncompromising advocates of gender equality, a champion of women's education and suffrage and a resolute critic of any discrimination against women on grounds of religion and tradition. Semantics apart, what matters is that he was resolutely opposed to inequalities and injustice based on the accident of birth as defined by caste. For him, caste was a social and not a religious institution and thus was not essential to Hinduism. This may be opposed to Dr. Ambedkar's, though very close to Narayana Guru's reading, but that does not make him an apologist for caste injustice. In any case, it would be anachronistic to expect Vivekananda to discuss caste the way we do in the post Ambedkar era. Ideological weapon and guide, overcoming anachronism and historical hubris is the real challenge for us in making sense of someone like Swami Vivekananda. It is all too easy for us to sit in judgment trying to measure him by our contemporary standards of political liberalism social justice and modernism. Even when we appreciate him, we seem to be saying, although he is religious, yet he appears to be rational. Although he is devout Hindu, yet he is secular. Although he is a defender of our heritage, yet he is modern. There is something fundamentally wrong here. Not just because the standards we used to hold him to were, were not prevalent during his time, not just because thinkers like him made it possible for us to formulate the positions that we have arrived at, but above all, because we assume that the values that we hold today are a stable vantage point to assess the universe. Vivekananda focuses us to radically rethink our own assumptions. He invites us to confront the spiritual vacuum that characterizes secular spaces, overcome rational superstitions about religions, reflect on how our modernity should be different from that of the West, rethink our relationship with Hinduism and other religions, and experience what it means to be a devout believer and deeply secular. Vivekananda is no doubt a powerful ideological weapon to attack the Sangh Parivar. It would be a pity, however, if we merely wield him as a weapon to be used selectively and not learn from him. To let his legacy be the tours that can point both outwards and inwards. Vivekananda can help us reclaim our republic if only we are willing to reimagine the spiritual and cultural meaning of our republic. Could that be a Vedantic approach to forging a new republic of India?